You would never tell an athlete to stop trying and just to, to stop training because they haven't gotten their personal best yet. So why are you telling yourself that this isn't worth it and that you should stop? Hey guys, it's Corey from Redefining Strength. Welcome to the Fitness Hacks Podcast. Today I'm going to share five reasons why you might be struggling to lose weight or see the fat loss results that you want. In this episode, I'm going to cover why seeking to lose weight faster on the scale might actually be sabotaging your fat loss results what a plateau truly is, and then Michelle's gonna share some tips to actually bust through those plateaus. I'm gonna share an amazing workout design to help you build muscle, which will actually help boost your metabolic rate to lose fat faster. Then we'll talk about why clean eating might not be getting you the results that you actually wanna see and why quality doesn't matter. Hear me out on that one. And then how to hit your macros, especially if you're new to tracking and actually see the results that you deserve. So let's jump right in. So let's talk about how trying to see faster weight loss on the scale might actually be sabotaging you. So if you're like me and you're a type A person, uh, you like control and doing more makes you feel more in control. When it comes to our diet and workouts, doing more generally means cutting our calories lower and training for longer, doing more reps, sets, more volume, more frequent workouts, even two a day sessions, right? We turn to doing more. But in our desire to feel more in control, to see that scale change faster, our doing more, we're actually sabotaging ourselves. And I want to go over why this is happening. So when we do see quick weight loss on the scale, it's often us depleting our energy stores. We put ourselves into that calorie deficit. So we're depleting our glycogen stores. We're losing water weight along with this. That can lead to quick drops on the scale. However, this is not truly fat being lost. And when we actually try and create a bigger calorie deficit, whether or not it is through overtraining or even through under eating, or maybe a combination of both, while we might see those quick change on the scale, yes, we might start to lose some fat. Ultimately, what's going to happen is our body's going to want to pump the brakes a lot sooner. So we might hit that plateau a lot more quickly too. It's why you might see a dramatic change and then be like, holy moly, nothing's happened for a really long time. And now I feel really low energy and really hungry and really miserable. And what's happened is your body's like, whoa, this is not normal. We don't have enough calories coming in to maintain where we're at because our body wants to maintain balance and it feels its survival is threatened. So what it does is say, let's pump the brakes here. This is how much energy we're getting. Let's find a more efficient way to run off this energy. That can mean that you start to actually fidget and move less. It can mean that you'll see your performance go down in the gym. It can also mean that you'll start to lose muscle. So in our attempt to create a more extreme deficit to try and lose weight on the scale more quickly, we're ultimately hindering our fat loss results. Our body will fight the weight loss, weight loss process to survive. And so why does it turn to muscle? Muscle is metabolically costly. What that means is it actually requires more energy to be maintained. So when you're training hard in the gym to build that lean muscle, you need to take in more fuel to actually get that muscle to grow. That muscle will then require more energy to be maintained even at rest. So when your body is like, we don't have enough energy coming in, we want to maintain as much of this energy for survival, it's going to be like, hmm, well, we can get energy out of muscle. And not only that, can we get energy out of the muscle, but we then don't have to expend the limited energy we have coming in to help maintain that muscle mass. Whereas fat storage, that doesn't take energy. That's great for us to have there. So we do turn to using our muscle as fuel. That's why when we're actually losing even weight quickly on the scale, we're not controlling for fat versus muscle being lost and we might lose more muscle mass. It's why we might start eating eating even less, like 800 calories, and then all of a sudden be like, I'm eating 800 calories, how am I not losing weight? You're feeling hungrier because your hormones aren't balanced. You're feeling hungrier because you're throwing off all the systems. Your body is telling you to eat more because it wants to have more energy for all the survival mechanisms to maintain the balance of where it's at. But you'll ultimately not end up losing weight at 800 calories because you've created these metabolic adaptations. When you ultimately give in, because we all have been there, right? We get too hungry. We can't maintain the extreme things that we've done. We regain the weight. We are not usually regaining muscle, we're regaining fat. And our metabolic rate has now been adapted and compromised, so to speak. And so the next time we try and lose, we don't even have that same muscle on to help us burn more calories as we're losing. So we've created these metabolic adaptations in our attempt to see faster weight loss or fat loss. And we've ultimately actually cost ourselves a lot of the lean muscle that would help us look leaner long term. So what can we do to actually control for losing as much fat as possible while maintaining the lean muscle? A, not creating that extreme deficit, and B, focusing on macros. You probably heard me say this a bazillion times, you're probably sick of hearing this, but 
protein matters most. A high protein diet is the only one that has been shown to help you not only retain, but building muscle in a deficit or even avoid gaining unwanted fat if you go into a slight surplus. Therefore, it gives you a lot more wiggle room in your calories. But you've got to be conservative in the calorie deficit that you're creating and make sure that you're focusing on those macros and embracing that it's going to take time. I know that's really, really stinky. We want to try and get better results faster. But if we get obsessed with seeing that scale number change, we can ultimately hold ourselves back. When the scale doesn't change, it doesn't even mean that body recomp isn't happening. I know we've heard that myth, you know, muscle weighs more than fat. One pound of muscle weighs the same as one pound of fat. However, having more weight on, if it's more muscle, might make you still take up less space, which is where that sort of comes from. Not to mention, if you gain one pound of muscle and lose one pound of fat, the scale's not going to change, but your body recomp is going to look dramatically different. So you do have to find other ways of measuring so that you're not sabotaging yourself, only judging based on the scale. So take those progress progress pictures, take those measurements, but remember that you want to set yourself up for long-term success. And that means dialing those macros, creating a smaller calorie deficit, but not trying to do more because you're trying to sort of trick your body, be sneaky about how you're going about the weight loss process. So it doesn't fight you more as it wants to survive. And that's why it does fight that weight loss process, but don't sabotage yourself by getting obsessed with that scale. No one likes to stall. Most of us think a plateau is two days without any change, but I want to dive in with Michelle to what plateaus really are, how we can overcome them and how we can help ourselves stay consistent when we do encounter those periods where it feels like nothing's happening, even though results are snowballing. So let's jump right in. So we're going to talk about plateaus today. And when we think about plateaus, if we don't see changes for one week, we're like, oh no, it's not working. If two weeks, it's like, it's really not working. But I've always considered that you can't make changes for at least four weeks. But in our talking, you have told me that eight to 12 weeks is sometimes necessary where results are building. And if we give up before those 12 weeks, we won't see them actually snowball. So can we talk a little bit about what a plateau is, Michelle, what we can do to help ourselves stay consistent, why they even happen? Yeah. So plateaus are when that scale is just not moving. And unfortunately, that is the measurement that everyone looks for, right? Is they are jumping on that scale and it is not moving. And the very first thing they say is I have hit a plateau. And I see so many clients where they hit this plateau. And like you said, four weeks, they start to get after, usually like after two weeks, they start to get nervous. Four weeks, they're starting to be like, okay, something's really wrong. But research actually shows that it's not really even considered a plateau until you've been stuck there for up to eight to 12 weeks. And obviously no one wants, that's the most dreaded answer. No one wants the answer that it's going to take more time because we're all impatient. We want those results fast. But what, what really is happening is one of the reasons why we hit those plateaus is your body is just playing catch up a little bit. Um, Your hormones have to play catch up to be able to kind of readjust so that you are going to see those weight loss results later down the road. We forget that it's a change for our body and that our body is fighting these changes a lot of times because it wants to maintain balance. Like even if we know where we're at right now is not healthy or ideal, our body's like, well, this is what we know. This is safe. And it feels like when you're trying to lose, it's survival is being threatened and therefore it's going to fight against it in any way it can. And so it's almost like you have to embrace not seeing results as things sort of, you break that dead zone almost. Yeah, you have to break the, and I like the best way I can say it is you have to embrace the suck. Like we all want to have the reward. We all want to be, you know, get to the podium, win, get the great trophy and win our prize. But the truth is, is everything that is going to be long lasting, everything that's going to be worth it is going to be an effort on our part and it's going to be hard at times. And this is quite frankly, the sucky part that most people experience at some point during their weight loss journey. I would love it if everyone got on the scale week to week and saw changes, but that's not going to be reality. So that lack of movement on the scale often leads to this frustration, but that doesn't mean that what you're doing isn't actually working. So how can we know, like, is this a plateau where we just need to keep going or should we jump ship? So first and foremost, the dreaded answer, you better not be trying to jump ship before 
the four weeks before that eight weeks at eight weeks, let's really kind of jump into it and see if we need to kind of shake some major things up. But having said that, there's going to be a couple of reasons to kind of pay attention on your journey to see if you are going to hit that, that plateau. And one of it is, you know, a lot of people will have that initial weight loss and then they get stuck. And oftentimes people don't fail. Well, they fail to recognize that when you've been working out at a larger weight, you are burning more calories just with that because you're carrying that extra that extra weight on you. You put it, you're putting more effort in your workouts because of the extra weight. When you drop that extra weight, all of a sudden you are burning less because you're not having to work as hard to move. And that's a good thing, right? Like it's a good thing to become more efficient. But when that does happen, that is going to be potentially a sign that, okay, you are in a smaller body. If you've lost 30 pounds or more, It may be a sign that we do need to kind of cut your calories a little bit because you do have a a slight decrease in your caloric needs because your body has shed that fat. It's interesting to think about the fact that we have to stay consistent, but we also have to be watching to adjust. And I think that's what you can sort of play with when you are in that like dead zone where you're not seeing results snowball in the same way. It's not bad to want to make little tweaks. You just don't want to do them willy nilly or throw things in that you don't know if it will work. And I think that's why I'm such an advocate of macros as you are too, because you can sort of take things back to basics and be like, okay, well, we can cycle ratios or we can cycle the progression of workouts that you're on or do all these different things that give you a little bit of control while keeping you focused on the fundamentals. Yeah. Those macro cycling, just kind of changing it up on your body because obviously consist overall consistency is going to be the key, but kind of making it so like, okay, we do know that you've lost weight and we may keep calories the same, but increasing that protein is going to increase that thermal effect of food. So we can kind of combat that. So it it helps us avoid these plateaus by making sure we are doing those, these macro cycling ratios. And then on top of that, I think it's just so important because when you're in it, when you are in your journey, you don't recognize all you recognize is the hard work you're putting in. And I think it's so important for anyone to have someone, a coach or someone that they're talking to, to be able to point out what they're doing right. Because I will hear sometimes people like, I'm doing everything right, but the weight isn't coming off. But they're not recognizing the body changes, the energy changes, their mood changes. And because they're so solely focused on that scale when they are seeing positive changes in other areas. We don't recognize those things. And I think having more ways of measuring them is super key. And then even understanding that part of what this is, is it's a mental game, right? It's not only that we're not seeing results. And so we're worried that maybe we're not doing the right things, but it's the mental game of we want to make a change because we want that control. And so finding that balance between giving ourselves a little bit of that control while also staying consistent is really key. And I think putting that focus on the other wins you're having, or if you're not having those other wins, assessing am I working hard as I think I am? Am I being as consistent as I really think I am? Or are there other things I can assess? But it's that step back and outside perspective that sort of pays off. Yeah. And and that's why it's important to continue to track, to continue to kind of see these data. So you have like, you can know what you're doing. You can know if you are truly being consistent because one of my things that I have seen, and I actually just read a research study on this is women tend to be worse at this than men, but women tend to overestimate what they're eating by up to 700 calories on average. Now, 700 calories, seven days a week, like, yeah, that's a big change. And if you are overestimating, you're not going to see that change on the scale. So this is one of the reasons why the tracking, even if you think you're eating pretty close to what you've been eating prior and you're just going off by the eyeball, you may be off. And this is why if you really are trying to lose that weight and wanting to see results, why tracking is just a great way to make sure you are staying consistent. If someone's tracking, they feel like they're at a plateau. It has been potentially even eight weeks without a change. And that's really no change. It's not two pounds up, three pounds down, one pound up. That's normal progress, right? Over the weeks, it does even out. You're moving forward. But if someone's seeing absolutely no change, what can they do to help themselves embrace the process? Because We don't want them just making changes without, you know, really being accurate in those changes or adjustments. So again, having more than one way to measure your progress. So really doing check-ins with yourself 
Is your energy higher? Has your sleep improved? Are clothes actually starting to fit a little bit different? And despite what most people th- think, like this doesn't mean looser. This can also mean tighter in different areas if you've seen like uh, looser and tighter in other areas when you have kind of body recomp happening. Um, but are you feeling more confident in the way your clothes are fitting? Are you taking those measurements? Are you noticing that you have a better mood? And it's really recognizing the positive changes and the lifestyle habits that you are creating. And then a, another one would be making sure that you are giving yourself control and giving yourself actions, actions to kind of complete, to create those good habits. So a big thing that I always talk to people is because they're like, I'm doing everything right. I'm putting in the effort. I'm eating well. I'm exercising but I'm not seeing the results. So is this worth it? And in my head, I'm like, okay, you're eating better. You're exercising. Why wouldn't that be worth it? Why? Like, if you don't, if you don't get, see the result on the scale, you're all of a sudden not going to continue to eat well and exercise when we know those two things are important for overall health and well being. If you're already creating those good habits and you know, you know what you're doing is good for you. Why would you stop eat, no matter what that scale says? And then really making sure that you are celebrating those wins along along the path. So recognizing your energy is improving and, and celebrate it. Recognize it. Share it. Tell other people that you the changes that you are seeing and that you're experiencing, even if it's just not on the scale. Because it does, other people are going to notice those positive changes too. And I always tell, my biggest thing is, is I always think of an athlete. Athletes work so hard on their nutrition, on their exercise to become the best that they can possibly be because they want to, they want to PR. They want to have a new personal best. They want to go out and do the best game or have the best race or whatever it may be. And they are doing the same drills, same things day in and day out. And they can be stuck and not have a, see a new PR for months, for And I'm going to use myself as an example. I, when I was racing, I was stuck at a time that I could not get under. And I did the same, you know, raced out, trained hard, did all the the things you're supposed to do. And for about a year, I didn't have a PR. And then about halfway through a season, all of a sudden I had a major drop. And once you have that major drop, it's easier to hit that PR again. And it's the same thing with your weight. Once you see that result, you can kind of maintain it longer and continue to stay at that weight. So it's not hard to keep it once you do get there. I think it's a great reminder that the basic habits and the boring habits, while they might be boring, while you might want excitement, those aren't the places to find excitement. It's the place to do those boring basics so you can find excitement in the things you actually want, whether it's a PR, whether or not it's being able to tackle something when you go on vacation that you weren't able to accomplish before, whether or not it's just feeling you know fabulous when you go to an event and knowing that you can rock that dress really confidently. It's putting in the boring basics to have the excitement somewhere else over trying to find excitement sometimes in those things. And then yeah, I was gonna say, and then even celebrating when you're taking the other measurements and doing the other things, we, we tend to go to the one area that doesn't change that we really want to change. So it's recognizing even in like taking pictures, the places that are changing that maybe you don't care about, but it's still showing progress or the performance in the gym. It's giving yourself that outside perspective. And I think it is important too, to kind of data is so important, but if you look at data and you consistently take the data, because I know we have, we all have clients or people that struggle because when they see them at numbers, it can be triggering to them. But sometimes just even challenging yourself to consistently do it is going to help desensitize you from like, okay, yeah, the scale is going to fluctuate. And I, but I'm going to see this overall trend down and I am going to see other changes happen um, in in the other measurements, in the other areas, taking those photos, those things are going to help desensitize the power that the scale has on you. I love that. I think so often we just let ourselves uh, be sort of taken control of by the tools instead of realizing this is just data. It's all me tracking. That's why I'm going to track in multiple different ways to see other progress. But again, going back to if you're doing all these healthy things, Trust in the process a little bit, knowing that you would not want to be doing these other healthy things because they're good for you anyway. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You would never tell an athlete to stop trying and just to stop training because they haven't gotten their personal best yet. So why are you telling yourself 
that this isn't worth it and that you should stop. Well, on that note, if you've hit a plateau, keep going. Use these three tips to really help you embrace the process and keep moving forward as hard as it is to be patient at times. So I want to talk about one of my favorite workout designs, density training, and how it can help you improve your metabolic health. If you are listening, I am going to demo a few moves just to help you understand how to design these workouts a little bit better. Uh, so check out the YouTube video. In terms of actually trying to get the best fat loss results, it really comes down to trying to build muscle with your workouts. I know often we think about our workouts just as a chance to burn more calories. And while yes, they do help us create that calorie deficit, we can use them to burn more calories. That shouldn't be their full sole purpose. Density training is great in that you are working more large muscle groups. It will be a little bit more metabolic, so you will see that higher calorie burn than slower lifting sessions. But the really key component of it is that it's a very efficient way to build muscle. Because you're using compound movements, because there is the timed element, it's easy to program in, especially when you are limited in terms of the time that you have to train. And it can be a great way to get in four very valuable sessions over having to do like a body part split, which might not be as efficient with six days a week. So if you're only training three or four times, really consider this workout design. So how do you do density training? You want to think about designing three different sort of sets or even a tri-set of exercises, and you're going to do 10 minutes on each set. So when I think about designing density training, I usually think about a full body split or anterior posterior, which is like front side, back side. So I would think about two different exercises for two different areas, because when you do that and you do an upper and a lower in a set together, you're allowing your upper body to actually rest while you're working your lower body. So while the muscles are resting, you might still find that your heart rate gets a little more elevated because you are alternating big muscle groups being worked. It is best for the bulk of these workouts to really focus on that big compound lift and heavier weights or more challenging variations over using as many isolation moves. However, you you can work into that third circuit in each workout in that tricep, potentially a little bit more isolation. And of course, there's always other variations and nuance to it that you can't implement. But I love more of that full body split or that anterior posterior with the big compound movements. When you're doing this, you want to think about working in that five to 10 rep range and you're thinking about doing a move for quality reps, okay? So you're gonna end up lifting more loads over the course of the time, not necessarily each and every rep, but you want it to be something where, you're, well, you're doing the five to 10 reps, you're doing a move that you could do for the 10 rep max, but because you're doing so much volume over the time, it's going down and down versus something that you could do for more reps. So again, it goes back to sort of the quality that you're able to do because you're keeping the reps lower, the weight's heavier, and you're not necessarily pushing to failure each and every round but over the course of the round, seeing your reps go down to be able to keep moving. So in terms of how you would design this, you might do something that is, you know, a like just a conventional deadlift with dumbbells and then even do rows as the next move. You might do something where you're doing a squat, okay, or a floor press. So you're going down to the ground and then pressing those weights. Both of those could be an anterior, which would be the squat and the floor press right here, or you could do a posterior, which would be the, the row and the conventional deadlift, but you would want to do row and conventional deadlift for 10 minutes, five to 10 reps of each. And you do want that weight to be something heavy where you can at most do 10 reps the first round, and then around eight reps, you're kind of maxing out, and then maybe you're staying at eight for a few rounds, and by the end, you're even getting to five. The more advanced lifter you are, the more you might start to, to push the weights even heavier so that on the last few rounds, you're even doing singles or doubles of something. But you want to think, how can I really move more weight over the course of the 10 minutes with very quality repetitions? But you want to use two big movements, so big compound lifts where you can use heavier weights, more challenging variations of opposing muscle groups. Uh, again, you can design a lot of different ways with this, but I like that full body split or the anterior posterior. So backside, front side, where you're doing the deadlift and the back row. And then maybe the next round you're doing a reverse lunge and a back fly. And then maybe you do include for that third 10 minute round, a tricep where you get into some bicep curls or some more hamstring focused isolation moves because you really do want to target specific stubborn areas. But you want to think quality in that 10 minutes and really moving as much weight as possible. This is a really efficient way to gain muscle, improve your metabolic health, and actually see better weight loss and fat loss results. So I wanna have you stop stressing about eating clean. 
Now I'm not telling you that whole natural foods don't matter, that you shouldn't worry about the micronutrients that you're taking in. You want quality fuel, okay? That's great for our health. It actually does help our body function optimally to see better results faster. However, I think often this focus on clean eating is also what sabotages our success and makes us feel guilty when we try and create that lifestyle balance. So if you've been thinking, I eat so clean, why am I not seeing results? It's because your portions are still off, plain and simple. As stinky as that is, we can be eating really great healthy foods, all quality foods, even no processed foods. You know, maybe you're even cutting out everything you ever enjoyed and you're not seeing results and it's because your portions are still off. Macros really matter and so do the calories based on how we're dialing in the macros to see the fat loss results that we want. Again, we can eat clean and be overeating or eat macros that are not in line with our needs and goals or what our body is actually needing at that time and then we won't see results. So I wanna stop this whole clean eating obsession, okay? Again, whole natural foods are key. Getting the nutrient-dense foods that we need can help our body function optimally. Uh, Nutrient-dense foods have been shown to have a higher thermic effect, which means it actually requires more energy for you to utilize those as fuel, which helps us you know, see better weight loss results, better fat loss results in general. We do need those micros to keep everything balanced, okay? so. In no way am I saying that quality doesn't expedite the process, but at the same time, if you're depriving yourself of all the foods you love and making yourself feel guilty, a lot of times this actually creates a bigger snowball than just having something that's not as clean for us, okay? So if you think about it, right, you eat one thing that's not within the acceptable foods on the list, all of a sudden you feel guilty, and then the next day you can't get back on track, or you don't know how to work those things back in when you actually do want them in a lifestyle, and then the snowball occurs where we get further and further away and 1%, 1% off from the habits that we need to be doing. And we've only ever tried to dial in our portions even through restriction. We've never learned how to balance in those things to have the proper portions, because that is what a lot of diets do too when they label foods as clean and dirty or good and bad, is they're creating a macro breakdown for you based on restricting the types of foods you can eat. But again, this doesn't allow us a lifestyle balance, which ultimately is often what sabotages us from actually maintaining results. We don't know how to work in the foods we love. It's much better to embrace macros and then embrace that 80-20 rule. Work in some of the foods that you know are maybe not the best for your health, but will actually help you stay more consistent over the year. Because that's something we don't consider enough. We go, I have to be 100% clean, and we do that for maybe six weeks, but then we don't think about all the other weeks out of those 52 weeks that we're actually not doing the things we should be doing because we felt so guilty even for falling off, right? So we don't wanna create that guilt or that restriction. And as much as we talk about, you know, tracking sometimes even being restrictive and obsessive and creating, you know, disordered patterns of eating, we have to recognize that by restricting foods or saying we're bad if we don't eat specific things, that's also creating a negative relationship with food that we don't want to, to let happen. Okay. So as much as quality fuel can help your body function a little bit better, it can help, you know, increase the thermic effect or the calorie burn to utilize that food as fuel. We want, and we want nutrient dense food because it even keeps us feeling fuller, right? We know having two bites of candy is like 200 calories and no, no fullness or no fullness from that at all, right? You're still hungry, right? Even though you ate even more. So nutrient dense foods have that high volume, but we want to work in the foods we love because that is ultimately what will help us create that long-term success. So stop making yourself feel guilty for not just eating clean and stop focusing even on eating clean if you want those aesthetic changes and realize that really you do have to dial in those portions. You do have to dial in those calories in general to make sure that you're seeing results. So if you like only eating clean and you have your version of clean that you love, of course, embrace it, but stop the guilt when you do enjoy foods that are maybe not as nutrient dense that are part of your lifestyle. So if you've ever said tracking doesn't work, I can't hit my macros, this is impossible, I want to give you some tips to help, okay? You have to realize that if you were hitting your macro ratios already, you would be seeing the results that you want. So hitting your macros is going to take you embracing the learning process. And unfortunately, most of us at some point have to go through being bad at something to learn how to be better at it. It, the more you plan ahead, the more you can sort of bypass some of that and not make as many mistakes. So planning ahead is definitely key, but you have to realize there will be the learning process. And in that, a lot of times we approach making changes from our singular perspective. So if you think about how you plan out meals, how you look at your day, you're, you're used to planning out things in a certain way, right? I have this breakfast. I have these different lunches that I eat. I have this dinner. You've prepped meals in a certain way. You've trained your body and your mind to approach eating in that way in those portions. So in order to hit your macros, you're going to have to take an outside perspective. So I want to give you some tips to really help you adjust. 
I also want to get you away from saying something doesn't work until you truly know if the data supports that. So often, because this is a big change, it feels hard. It is hard. And even when we make one swap or two swaps, if we're doing some of the habits, but the consistency really isn't there in terms of hitting the calories, in terms of hitting the macros, it can feel like we're working really hard and not seeing results. And we say it doesn't work. But the actual reality of it is we're not actually testing the ratio. We're not actually testing the calories because we haven't hit them. So I do need you to step back if you're saying this isn't working and look at how is your consistency? Are your days all up and down? Are they actually even across the board? Yes, you want those weekly averages to average out. You want to hit your macros and your calories for the week. But if every day is so up and down, you're not actually testing the ratio or the calories to know what works. And that could be contributing to some of your low energy or feeling like you're not fueled or like things aren't working. So you want to get that data daily consistency that yes, does add up to that weekly consistency, monthly consistency, but especially to start that daily consistency to actually tell you, is this macro breakdown right for me? Do I function better off a high carb, low carb, high protein? Are these calories actually correct? But you need to actually test a ratio to know if it works or doesn't work. So don't let the feeling that you're working so hard or making some of the habit changes of even weighing and measuring food and logging sort of take you away from actually whether or not you're consistent. Review that data because those feelings of working hard might not be in line with what you're actually doing, okay? But then you want to think about how can I approach making changes in a new and better way? And one of the best ways to do this is to log an average day. Maybe you just log today. Just log today, no thought as to whether or not it's good or bad, it's hitting any macros, just log today. Or if you're sitting here, you know, at night, think, hey, how can I log tomorrow? What would I like to eat tomorrow? Enter those foods in. Then as tedious as this might be to start, but this is how you get through the learning process a lot faster, go and look at each ingredient. What ingredients are higher in protein? What are higher in carb? What are higher in fats? That way you can learn the breakdown of the meats that you're consuming or the different uh, plant-based proteins or you know the different carb sources, vegetables, all these different things because everything has a slightly different breakdown. White rice, wild rice, and brown rice all have slightly different breakdowns of the nutritional like macro breakdowns. So by even looking at that, you might find a little swap in the type of rice is all you need. It doesn't have to be dramatic, but look at each ingredient. Then think instead of, I have to get rid of this meal, I can't have this, I have to eat chicken and broccoli. Think what's one small change to a meal I already have that I could make that would actually add up to to improved results towards my macros. So if you have, let's say tacos and you have two ounces of meat in each taco, maybe you say, hey, can I put even half an ounce more in each one or three ounces? Or if I'm using chicken thigh and I notice that chicken thigh has a lot more fat, could I use chicken breast instead, right? So start to look at those ingredients and make little swaps to either the cut of meat, the type of vegetable, or even exactly how much. Even thinking, you know, like here's a uh, different fruit. If I look at a tropical fruit versus a berry, those are going to have very different carb breakdowns. How can I even swap those things in? Could in my dessert, which I usually use a full fat Greek yogurt, do a lower fat Greek yogurt. Even if you look at different like brands of Greek yogurt that are low fat, you might find one, like I have one in the fridge right now that's 80 calories, one that's 90, one that's 170 because they have different pr- protein breakdown. So not only based on the calories I have left, but even the macros I need to hit, I know I can have one that has 12 grams of protein and six grams of carbs versus one that has 25 grams of protein and eight grams of carbs, right? I can use those different things to hit my macros just even by looking at different brands. But look at each of the ingredients and start making small swaps to your recipes. Then even search out macro-friendly options for things you like to include. So if you know that having, you know, your ice cream for dessert will actually only lead to you wanting more ice cream, maybe you say, hey, the Ben and Jerry's I don't stop with, but I'm going to try Halo Top instead. Think about those small swaps in that way. Even looking for the recipes that you've enjoyed in the past, I had one client have uh, an Indian dish that she made and she switched in, uh, I think it was fat-free condensed milk, and then she used a different type of protein and even combined two proteins and put in some cauliflower rice with some rice to, to actually cut back on the carbs and even boost the nutrient density and get those vegetables in there. She just made little swaps that didn't, for her, sacrifice the taste or feel of the dish and still allowed her to enjoy that meal while hitting her macros. And the great part about that is, is like even off of that single dish, even off of a single salad, you can use different dressings based on the macro ratio you even have to include recipes that you like, even as you cycle and change those macro breakdowns. But the best thing you can do for yourself is remember that you actually have to test a ratio and get consistency in that to know if it works. And the only way to get yourself to have a new perspective, because you're going to approach meal prepping and meal planning and portions from the perspective you always have, that's why you've been doing these things, you've trained yourself to do them. You have to go into your actual log and start to look at how you can make changes. 
see it as a little game too, because you're not going to know the breakdown of every food. I can tell you, I've had, you know, different people work for me who have been like, holy moly, I didn't realize how much fat was actually in an egg. Now I've added in some egg whites and it changed everything, right? It can be small swaps, but really look at those ingredients on an average day and see the smallest changes you can make to have that really pay off because that's going to feel more sustainable than feeling like you have to completely revamp your diet. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of the Fitness Hacks podcast. If you've been enjoying the episodes, please leave a review and I'd love to hear your comments on your biggest takeaways. Thank you.